So, ladies and gentlemen, we have Mr. Doug Evans, who is going to present to us tonight. Um, uh, Doug is a conservation architect with over 37 years experience in repair and conservation of historic buildings and ancient monuments. Now, he's a board member of ICOMOS UK and chair of ICOMOS UK Wood Committee. And, and uh, Doug is, has been absolutely instrumental in getting this Wood Committee together. He's been superb. Um, and um, yeah, it, it's it's great to have him present today. Um, normally he's and normally he's the one introducing people and talking about that today. It's, it's my turn to introduce Doug, and um, yeah, we're very much looking forward to it, Doug. So uh, please uh, proceed to share your screen. Wonderful. How's that? Perfect. There we go. Is that it? That's it. And just one Bye. quick, quick thing before I forget is that everybody has um, where you can see yourself and others. You have some icons above this, the video screen. There's a small one, a medium one, a large one and a gallery. If you want to see more of Doug's presentation, you can choose the smaller icon. Um, if you want to just see Doug alone, you would choose the next icon to the right hand side of that. So it's the, the, the medium one and that's the speaker icon. So if you choose that, which is what I do, because I like to see Doug, then, then you'll, you'll just see Doug when, he, when he's speaking. Okay. Okay, go ahead Doug. Brilliant. Thanks, Vincent. Um, hi everybody. Um, some of you have um, seen this before in one form or another. Um, that the first time uh, Vincent told me I needed to be more pithy. Um, the, the second time it was a very, it was a short virgin, version uh, and um, Tina was waving um, yellow flags at me to, to finish. Um, but uh, I'm gonna crack on with it this time. It's a little bit longer. Uh, so I um, hope it don't bore you too much. Um, the ICOMOS International Wood Committee's uh, Focus on Africa Symposium was a study tour and international conference held in Ethiopia between the 22nd and the 28th of January in uh, 2019. Um, the symposium was organized by the IWC in collaboration with Addis Ababa University, the Ethiopia Ministry of Culture and Tourism, and the European Union's program for promotion of uh, heritage for Ethiopia's development. Uh, the study tour and conference had two objectives uh, of uh, publicizing the unique timber heritage of Ethiopia uh, internationally as being uh, the most ancient in the world and to promote timber heritage in Ethiopia as a cultural resource. Uh, furthermore, the event aspired to place Ethiopia at the forefront of wooden built heritage conservation in Africa by connecting Ethiopian institutions and individual experts with the network of ICOMOS experts. The first part of the Focus on Africa Symposium was a six day study tour of significant ancient monuments in Ethiopia. We met on day one in Addis Ababa. Hey, there's Jim. Glad you could make it, Jim. Uh, thanks, Doug. Sorry, yeah, sorry I'm late. Okay. We met on day one in Addis Ababa, then flew north to the city of Aksum. On day four, four we flew from Aksum to Lalibela, and on day six, flew back to Addis for the conference on day seven. I'm not sure, there's my mouse. So basically it was up, down, or first around here, then around here, and then back down to Addis for the conference. Um, it was an amazing experience. The, um, our guide for the study tour was the International Heritage Consultant and um, ex-IWC President David Micklemore. David was assisted by volunteers from the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. Before flying, to, uh, flying north to the Highlands, we spent the morning in Addis visiting historic timber buildings accompanied by students from the Ethiopian Institute of Architecture at uh, Addis Ababa University. The house of Rem Ras Mangesa Atikem was built in the 1890s. Ras Mangesa was one of the Emperor Menelik's commanders in the Battle of Adwa in 1886. 
this was the decisive battle that ended the first Italian Ethiopia War. Ras is a title in Ethiopia equivalent to Lord. Nearby was the house of Ras Kabedi Mangesa, the son of Ras Mangesa Atikem. Sorry for the tongue twisters. Um, Jim will remember this house. The house was built about 1900. The, the architectural and timber engineering design was carried out by Armenians, the masonry work by Arabs, and the carpentry by Indians. In the 1970s, the house was expropriated by the Dirge militia, and in 2004, the Ethiopian Heritage Trust took possession and have since renovated and made it their headquarters. During the visit, uh, there was, um, shall we say, a visit, vigorous discussion about the wood species, and um, even more vigorous um, about the methods and standards of refinishing. Uh, now empty and dilapidated, the house of Negradas Haile Georges was also built about 1900. Georges was the emperor's chief of the merchants with uh, the authority to collect market taxes and customs. We had lunch in the former Hotel Europe, which is now the Fine Fine Restaurant, and which originally served as the banqueting hall of Emperor Menelik II. It was designed by Armenian, the Armenian architect Minas Kerbekian in 1915, and in the early 1930s, it was reopened as a spa at the order of Emperor Haile Selassie I. After lunch, we flew north to the city of Aksum, the site of the historic capital of the Aksumite Empire from the 5th century to the 10th century AD. For our visits on day two, we split into two groups, and some delegates were able to visit two important ancient monuments in Aksum. The tombs of the ancient royal cemetery at, at Aksum are marked with monolithic stelae. The three largest, built between the third and fourth centuries AD, imitate stylized Aksumite timber architecture carved in stone. Note the banding, uh, the round motifs, and the window and door dressings. You'll see these again later. Also near Aksum is the Temple of Yeha, the oldest standing structure in Ethiopia. The temple was built in the Sabian style and has been dated to around 700 BC through comparison with ancient structures in the southern Arabian Peninsula. Leaving Aksum, a two-hour drive into the Adigrat Mountains brought us to Debra Damo Monastery. Ethiopian Christian beliefs dictate that no women or female animals are allowed in their monastery. And I can see that, I can imagine the faces on uh, um, uh, the girls out there now. So regrettably, the women delegates were not able to join us. The monastery is built atop an amba, uh, which is a steep-sided, uh, steep-sided flat-topped mountain and access is up a vertical cliff by a 17 meter rope made from goat hide. The adventurer and author David Buxton, writing about his travels in Ethiopia between 1942 and 1945, described his experience upon approaching Debradamo. We stopped for some breakfast and then continued the climb, gradually circling round the far side of the mountain. The cliffs that had, had at first faced us were several hundred feet high and perfectly vertical, but that, now they were reduced and we came soon to the lowest point of all, a mere 50 feet of smooth rock face. At the top of this cliff, a small wooden door opened into space. And from that perilous, perilous threshold, 50 feet of stout rope dangled down to the foot of the rock. This grueling rope crop climb has not changed since Buxton first um, uh, wrote about it. Fortunately, a monk was on hand at the top to pull us, help pull us up, and some, us, some of us found it easier than others. Vincent, aka Spider-Man, ascended without help, 
but I think poor Magnus was a bit bow leg for the rest of the day. <laughs> the monastery is situated at the top of the Amba Plateau, and the church sits with its own within its own enclosing. Oh, wait, 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 wait! Come, come, wait! Yeah, yeah, baby, baby, yeah, yeah, come. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. The oh. views from the plateau are breathtaking. <laughs> Um, we risked the climb to visit the Timber Monastery Church of Abu Abuna Aragawi, built about the 6th century AD. Is this the oldest uh, standing timber structure in the world? The lace timber masonry walls are built in the traditional Aksumite method with courses of irregular, irregular stone alternating with lacing timbers held in place by cross timbers, or as they are known locally, monkey heads and interlocked by solid wooden coins at the corners. Passing from the narthex into the small nave, we noted the hand-polished monkey heads, the window and door frames, and timber oh, column no, capitals no, no. and paneled ceilings. Both groups then drove south to visit Wukro Cherkos, a rock-hewn church built about the, seven, the 8th century AD. We arrived during the, the daily evening uh, service. From 1868, when the British expedition to Abyssinia reported the existence of the church, until the early, early 20th century, Wukro Cherkos was the only rock-hewn church known to the outside world, even before Lalibela. It is cruciform in plan, and, narth and the narthex has a central pier pillar. Here the porch walls and ceilings are covered in wall paintings. In the interior of the church, we noted the way the stonework imitated traditional Aksumite timber details in the carved stone columns, capitals, and frieze to the barrel vault of the nave. During our visit, our, our very own wood scientist, Jim Colson, couldn't help getting his pocket lens out to examine the species of the wooden doorpost. Yeah, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> On day three, we piled into Toyota Land Cruisers for the drive to see the Atsby and then up into the mountains and overland. Cherkos Agabo, a timber church built in the 18th century, um, is built into an, uh, a rock overhang. The walls are built according to the, again, to the traditional Aksumite method with courses of irregular stone alternating with lacing timbers held in place by the monkey head cross timbers and interlocked with solid wooden coins. The ceilings are all constructed in a different manner. The nave ceiling is a timber lattice. The aisles have heavy timber joists with paneled ceilings, paneled infills, and a wooden arch with carved deck decoration leads to the small sanctuary beyond, where the ceiling is made of overlaid and incrementally decreasing wooden quadrants to form a domed space. You can, we were never allowed into the sanctuaries, which is uh, sacred and only for um, the priests, but we were able, just able to, to get a peek of the, um, the, uh, the domed ceiling in the sanctuary beyond. After Agabo Church, we drove on to another set of hills and hiked up from the plateau to Debra Salam Mikel, a timber cave church built in the 8th century. This small church is set back inside a deep rock overhang of the cliff ab above with its entrance enclosed within a roof structure, this uh, uh, little green and white building you see here.
Inside the entrance structure, the enclosing walls of the church are built up tight to the cave roof in the traditional Aksumite method with courses of regular squared stones and lacing timber. The stones are tightly scribed to fit the wooden coins and monkey heads. It is important to note the refined masonry of, the, of this church compared to that of Cherkos Agabo we visited earlier and built in the same period. The ceilings of the nave and inner sanctuary are hewn up into the rock of the cave roof while the aisle ceilings are in timber. Driving on, we came to Mikel Imba, an 8th century AD rock hewn church carved down into the top of an amba, you see here. We passed a wooden ladder that generations of congregants had used to climb up the cliff in the past, but thankfully a newer steel stair now serves in its place. The narthex with its central column leads through a typical olive wood framed doorway, almost a portal into the nave. Stepped capitals of the aisle columns and corbelled capitals of the nave are both typical Aksumite profiles. Mikael Imba, Imba is also significant for its surviving 12th century olive wood screens or transenna fronting the sanctuary. A short note here, uh, just to put construction dates into context. Uh, the rock-hewn churches that we've seen um, in Tigray uh, were built three centuries earlier than the world-famous churches of Alibella that we were going to be seeing in a, in a few days. On day four, on day, well, the next day actually, on day four we flew south to the town of Lalibella for lunch before driving through undulating hills to our next visit. The church we were about to see was at the head of a wooden ravine filled with ancient juniper. David Buxton again writes, the path we followed led, de led down into the ravine and up to the mouth of an enormous cave, half hidden by cedars. This is Yimrahana Christos Cave Church, built in the early 11th century. Behind its screening wall, the walls of the church are built in the Aksumite style with courses of stone alternating with lacing timbers held in place by solid wooden coins. The stone is plastered over and there, and there are no monkey heads. The elevations facing the cave entrance are heavily restored, but the elevations facing the back of the cave, not so much. The building with its wooden ceilings and wall paintings is an important link between the architecture of the 6th century church at Debra Damos and the 11th to 13th century rock-hewn rock churches of Lalibela. One of the highlights of the trip was a fuel mule trek on day five. Along the way, we stopped to see Janata Mariam, a rock-hewn church built in the 13th century and also visited, visited by David Buxton in the 1940s. The mule trek began about 8 a.m. And, and we didn't get back until after sunset. The trek to see two more cave churches was 16 kilometers, rising 1,100 meters to 3,000 meters above sea, level, above sea level, up here. On the way, we were passed by whole families, climbing up the mountain on foot, seemingly without effort. Where on earth were they going? At the top of our climb was Makina Medhane Alem, Alam Cave Church, built in the 12th or 13th century. Behind the screen wall across the mouth of the cave is another wall enclosing the churchyard. The masonry walls of the church itself are built in banded courses of random and ashlar stone with wood frame windows and doors in the Aksumite style. The interior space of the church is small and comprised of a nave with a high roof and a domed sanctuary. Our host David Micklemore was hopeful that wall painting, wall painting experts would soon be able to date the church more precisely. After lunch, 
of freshly butchered and grilled goat, we continued across the plateau and down a steep crevasse to the sound of singing and chanting. On the other side of the mountain, an Easter service was taking place. Aha! All those families. Ludata Mariam, another cave church built in the 12th or 13th century, is a very simple building with plastered masonry walls. We were fortunate to be allowed in at the end of the children's service and to receive a welcome from the church elders. The interior was even smaller than Makina Medan, Medane Alam, with the king post trusses supporting the, nave root, the raised nave roof and every service co covered in wall painting. Traditionally carved and warmed po worn posts formed the sanctuary screen. Uh, these again were in olive wood. This being Easter, there was a celebration and more food and a warm send off back down the mountain. It was a long day, but well worth every scratch, ache, and pain. That evening, we enjoyed a wonderful dinner with entertainment and dancing. <laughs> That's got you, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't me, it just looked like me. There are a lot of people in Ethiopia that look like that. Yeah, of course, yeah, of course. <laughs> On the last day of the tour, tour before flying back to Addis, we were fortunate to have a short visit to see a few of the world famous churches in Lalibela. Here, the kings of Ethiopia constructed 11 rock hewn churches between the 11th and 13th centuries, seeking to recreate Jerusalem. The churches at Lalibela are clustered in two major groups. Um, one representing the earthly Jerusalem, Jerusalem and the other representing the heavenly, heavenly Jerusalem. Located directly between them is a trench rep representing the River Jordan. The buildings are monolithic, carved from a sloping mass of red volcanic scoria, underlaid by dark gray basalt and interconnected by a maze of tunnels and passages with openings to hermit caves and catacombs. Some are of the basil basilica type and have archaic features imitating architectural elements from earlier periods, yet they differ in design and style. Regrettably, our sh time was short and we were only able to see three of these extraordinary churches. Doug, you're 20 minutes in. Cheers, okay. I think I'm more than halfway. <laughs> Bete Mariam thought to have been built in the 11th century and therefore said to be the oldest church in Lalibela. Note the window details typical of early Aksumite timber construction. You see them here. You've seen these before. The modern 20th century roof, one of four, was installed with EU funding in 2008 and designed by Italian engineers in an attempt to provide temporary protection for the fragile structures until a more long-term solution could be decided upon. Bete Medani Alam is the largest of the Lale Bale churches and is said to be the largest rock-hewn church in the world. The Salvo dates the building to the second half of the 12th century. The 12th century Lale Bale cross is housed in the church. Of course, we couldn't miss seeing uh, perhaps the most famous rock hewn church in the world. This is Betty Georges or St. George, the last to be built of the 11 churches in Lalibela, and which is thought to be late 12th or early 13th century. After visiting the extra extraordinary rock hewn churches of Lalibela, we flew back to Addis for the conference, but there was still time before dinner and more historic timber buildings to visit. Professor Basile Georges, an architect and chair of conservation 
of the Urban and Architectural Heritage at the Ethiopian Institute of Architecture, showed us his project to convert the former house of Ras Biru Woldi Gebrail into what is now the Addis Ababa, Ababa Museum. Ras Biru was Menelik II's war minister. We next visited the massive former palace of Sheikh Hojeli al Hassan. Sheikh Hojeli was governor of the Asosa region under Menelik II. The house was built in the beginning of the 20th century and has influences of in Indo Islamic architecture. Currently, it serves as a residence for 30 families and a school. That evening, we went for dinner to the Addis Ababa restaurant, a timber house built in the 1890s as the marital home of Princess Zauditu, who later ruled as Empress Regnant from 1916 to 1930. Day seven, the final trip, day of our trip to Ethiopia, was a one day international conference on the promotion and protection of timber heritage organized by the ICOMOS International Wood Committee in collaboration with the Ethiopian Minister of Ministry of Culture and Tourism and the Promoting Heritage for Ethiopia's Development Program of the European Union. The conference was held in the United Nations Conference Center in Addis Ababa. The organizers brought together an excellent group of experts who spoke authoritatively on a range of topics. Ambassador Johan, or Johan Borgstam, head of the EU delegation to Ethiopia, wel welcomed us all to the conference. And Mikel Landa, architect and IWC president, opened the proceedings with a talk on the relevance of the intangible in the conservation of wooden heritage. Professor Fasil Georges, Georges, who we met the day before, presented his research on early timber architecture in Addis Ababa. And the UK's Dr. Brian Ridout, Ridout presented the results of his investigations on the insect infestations in the Aba, Jifar, and Kumsa Moroda palaces in Ethiopia. In Sukcho, the architect and IWC member from Korea spoke on the Jong Jagak wooden memorial pavilions of the royal tombs of the Joseon dynasty. Chen Gao, an architect and ID, IWC member from China, presented a talk about her work involving traditional building construction in China and the influence of modern technology. And the UK's very own our, our very own Vincent, uh, historic wood cons woodwork conservator and restorer, gave a very interesting present presentation on the restoration of surface finishes on wooden heritage. Uh, all, pre uh, all prepared, I might add, during the tour and stemming from observations made during our visit. The amazing Magnus Yoholm, a carpenter and archaeologist and IWC member, spoke about his work on woodcraft and research in Sweden. And Tina Wick, Tina Wick, Swedish architect and IWC secretary general, reported on efforts to save the Rum Orphanage in Buyukata in Turkey. David Micklemore, team leader of the Prohedive program, helped us to put Aksumite architecture in context um, as, and its timber-laced construction and ancient and widespread structural tr tradition. I presented a draft re IWC re resolution in support of the conservation of the 7th to 8th century church at Zurema, Georgia, a very significant building at risk that regrettably we were unable to uh, visit. Haile Melikot Agizu, a senior conservator at the Ethiopian Authority for Research and Conservation of Cultural Heritage, reported on the plans for a new Ethiopian 
ICOMOS National Committee. The day conference also included poster sessions, poster presentations from uh, our, our in, in, individuals and organizations around the world. The symposium's closing reception was held at the remarkable Zoma Museum in Addis Ababa. In the words of the museum's website, Zoma Museum is centered around learning and bringing into the present construction techniques that have withstood time and weathering while maintaining their grace and beauty. The museum's aim is to showcase innovative and cutting edge art and architecture in the vernacular mu museum where the old and the new merge. The IWC Bureau would like to thank everyone involved in organizing the Focus on African Symposium and making it such a success. I'm sad to report that Haile Mekla Egizu, who we met in Addis and who did so much, much to push for a new Ethiopian Nicomos National Committee, died in September last year. The Ikomos Secretariat put me in contact with Mikias Gebra Selassie Tekle, who has taken up the reins from Haile Mekalot. Mikias told me there is a strong working group still pushing to realize Ikomos Ethiopia. Perhaps uh, Mikael can update us on their progress, and we wish them well in this. And the IWC looks forward to welcoming our first Ethiopian member soon. Ethiopia is a wonderful country and everyone on our trip agreed this had been an extraordinary experience. We learned that Ethiopia has a unique wooden built heritage, which could well be the most ancient in the world. All the churches we visited remain in use, performing their original religious function and many contain religious treasures in the form of manuscripts, portable paintings, crosses, crowns, fistra, drums, and other religious artifacts. The churches we visited on days two and three in Tigray province are all included in the sacred landscapes of Tigray serial sites nominations to the Ethiopia's World Heritage tentative list. The Tigray nominations satisfied five of the six criteria for selection of World Cultural Heritage Sites. To quote the World Heritage nomination, Tigray is home to 121 rock-hewn churches believed to represent the single largest group of rock-hewn architecture in the world. The masonry and wood-built churches provide the earliest surviving examples in the world of the use of timber to create structures illustrating the importance of wood as one of the primary materials in the development of architecture. Regrettably, we were unable to see the seventh century church of Zarema Georgis, possibly the second oldest standing timber structure in the world. The priests would not allow us access because they said part of the roof had collapsed and the interior was not safe. In 2019, the, sorry, the 2019 operational guidelines for the implementation of the World Heritage Convention notes that the cultural and natural heritage is among the priceless and irreplaceable assets, not only of each nation, but of humanity as a whole. The loss or deterioration or disappearance of any of these most prized assets constitutes an impoverishment of the heritage of all the peoples of the world. The sacred landscapes of Tigray nomination was submitted in February of 2018. The IWC should push for a Nicomos mission to be organized to visit as many of the churches on the tentative list, especially Zarema, Georgia. The objective of the site mission should be to check if the conditions of authenticity and integrity are met and what degree are present or expressed by significant attributes, and to check the adequacy of, of protection and management systems, 
the adequacy of the proposed boundaries of buffer and buffer zones, the present state of conservation of the properties, the assessment of the factors affecting the property, including threats, the detection of new threats not reported, and how the state parties plan to mitigate them and to ensure the safeguarding of the properties for present and future generations. The cave churches of Amhara province are similarly unique and worthy of the world's attention. And the IWC should encourage the Ethiopian Ministry of Culture and Tourism to consider submitting them for a World Heritage nomination as an important step to ensuring their long-term conservation and protection of these priceless and irreplaceable cultural assets. David Micklemore was hopeful that resources would be available from German banking interests to fund dendrochronology investigations on the Anhammer and Amhara cave churches. The wall paintings we saw cover almost the whole period of Ethiopian wall paintings from the 11th and the 12th to the 20th century. As mentioned earlier, David and Esther were hopeful that wall painting experts could help to date the Amhara cave churches. And after the symposium, negotiated with the Ethiopian ministries to, for approval to run a workshop on the conservation of wall paintings. Funding from Ethiopian Heritage Fund was obtained. Two bit British trainers came for a workshop, but sadly, in the end, the necessary government approvals couldn't be secured and uh, they had to cancel the workshop. The study tour, the, the, um, the ICOMOS Wood Committee study tour and conference activities were designed to demonstrate the value of collaboration in the safeguarding and promotion of heritage for socio-economic development. Moreover, the activities were intended to strengthen the protection of heritage and connect stakeholders with donors and sources of funding, as well as to extend comparable capacity building and training activities to all regions of Ethiopia. This is something, this is something that is perhaps um, unfinished. And the idea IWC should reach out to those still working on creating an Ethiopian ECOMOS National Committee. Um, that's it. Um, uh, it, it was a great trip, uh, um, and I look to, forward to many more, many more of these uh, group photos. Um, maybe just to um, kick off another discussion. Uh, the discussion on timber laced, um, laced timber construction also um, uh, encouraged others to, to start sending in photos of um, laced timber buildings in their own part of the world. These are um, uh, two photos um, I got from, I was sent by Aner from uh, uh, Turkey. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, uh, people will be encouraged to start sending in more. That's it, Vincent. All over to you. Wonderful. Well, Doug, thank you very, very much. I think a big round of applause for Doug, please. <laughs> Fantastic.